From accessing remote cloud services to running modern on-premise applications, the interface of choice is now the web portal. With client access from a browser and HTML as the standard way of interacting with applications, the use of web portals has helped make computing much more user-friendly. The web portal may be presenting just a static set of web pages. It may be presenting HTML web pages with active content such as JavaScript, ASP and PHP. The web portal may be presented directly from an HTML capable application and increasingly data is provided through what are known as REST API services which enables machine-to-machine -machine interaction using web protocols. What all this means is that when we're engaged to do a penetration test we're likely to be wanting to do a significant part of it on web-based services. To do this effectively we need to have testing tools which understand web protocols and provide the capabilities we need to work with them. There are many web testing tools available from the simple systems such as WhatWeb to dedicated web penetration testing tools such as OWASP's Z-Attack Proxy. However, the tool of choice for professional web pen testers is Burp Suite. Burp Suite is a complete solution and an extendable framework for doing web penetration testing. It can scan a website and spider its way to discover every page. It can check the website for vulnerabilities. It can sit between a user and a website as a proxy and monitor and manipulate traffic. It can be used to create and send test messages into websites and applications. Burp Suite comes in three editions. There's an Enterprise Edition, which provides all the features of the Professional Edition, but also includes integration into Enterprise DevOps workflows. The Professional Edition provides a full suite of capabilities for the professional pen tester. There's also a Community Edition, which is free of charge, but doesn't have some of the advanced features of the Professional Edition. Nevertheless, it's a very powerful tool to start doing web testing. Let's take a first look at the Burp Suite tool and get familiar with what it offers. We won't go into too much detail here, as we'll be covering a lot of the tool's functions as we go through the course. The Burp Suite Community Edition comes as one of the tools pre-built into Kali, and we can find it in the Web Application Analysis menu. In Kali's top ribbon, I've set up some favourite applications for quick access. One of these is Burp Suite Professional, which I've installed. For now, let's select Applications, Web Application Analysis, Burp Suite, and start the Community Edition tool. When Burp Suite starts, it asks whether we want to upgrade, but we'll skip that. We'll accept the default temporary project, and we'll start Burp Suite using its default settings. The Community Edition only allows temporary projects, and we need to use the professional version if we want to store projects on disk which is usually required when doing a full customer website test. However, the temporary project will be fine for this first look at Burp Suite. Burp Suite creates a new project and opens the main screen. The Burp Suite menu is at the top left and offers five main menu items Burp, Intruder, Repeater, Window and Help. Below the menu is the Burp Activity ribbon. In addition, as we go through the course, we'll see that we can call on a context menu. This gives us a number of ways of doing the same things in Burp Suite, and you'll develop your own style of use as you get experienced with it. I've run Burp Suite against the Metasploitable server to load some data. Let's start with our landing page, the dashboard. This has four panels, tasks, event logs, issue activity, and its associated advisory panel. In the task panel, we can see that we're set to capture pages as they pass through Burp Suite. The event log just has one entry, which is that the proxy has started, which it did when we started Burp Suite. At the right, there are some example issues showing, but the issue checking is only active in the professional version. The task ribbon has three status buttons and three action buttons. We have one live task running, a passive crawl. We can see above this two buttons which enable us to create a new live task, but not a scan, because the community edition of Burp Suite doesn't support active website crawling. If we click on the settings icon to the right of this panel, we can edit the scope and scan configuration of our live tasks. Next to the dashboard, we have the target functions. 
The site map is the main screen we use when we're working with targets, and we can see our target web tree at the left and the message exchanges at the top right. Below the message exchanges, we have the details of the request and response messages relating to the highlighted exchange. We can select the layout we want to use for these, request and responses either horizontally, vertically, or as tabs. It's entirely personal preference as to how you work with this panel. To the right of these, we have the inspector panel. The inspector provides key extracts from messages to save us having to delve into the message itself. Let's have a look at scope. In proxy mode, Burp Suite will capture all the traffic, but we might want to be more selective. The scope settings allow us to define the scope of the work we're doing by including or excluding URLs, and will allow us to filter traffic based on that. This helps avoid clutter distracting us from the main messages we need to see, and in this case, we're filtering just 10.0.2.20 in the scope. The final item in the target functions is this issue definitions. These provide a handy reference to the issues that Burp Suite knows about and can highlight for us through its auditing. Moving on to proxy, we have four items here, intercept, HTTP history, WebSockets history, and options. Let's start with proxy intercept. This is where we can choose to intercept and hold messages so that we can modify them prior to forwarding them onto the website or even dropping them entirely. Interception is set on by default when Burp Suite starts up, and if we don't want to block traffic, then we need to switch it off. We can see that we have the option to open a browser in order to work with a target directly from Burp Suite. We can also use Carly's own browser and direct it through Burp Suite, and we'll see how to do that shortly. Portswigger kindly provides some documentation links on this page in case we need help understanding how to set up and use a proxy. And you might like to take a look at these after the course. HTTP history and WebSockets history provide a record of each of the two message streams, retaining a record of all messages that have transited, even if they're out of scope. We can annotate these records if we want to take notes as we're working through the pen testing and we can filter and sort the records as needed. WebSockets are connections used to enable machine-to-machine -machine interaction. They're set up via an HTTP connection and then interact using their own style of message. Modern web applications that use WebSockets will typically use JSON packets to exchange information. Burp Suite is able to work with this traffic by capturing the WebSocket exchange and then enabling replay. The options function is where we set the proxy port to listen on, or in fact multiple proxy ports. We'll just be using a single proxy port, but Burp Suite has a very sophisticated approach to multi-proxying, which can meet the most demanding pen testing requirements. We can see we're actively listening on port 8080. Burp Suite offers an extensive selection capability to enable us to select what we intercept based on specific parts of the message stream. If we scroll down, we can see that we're set to intercept all traffic, except for files which have specific extensions. Below that, we see that we're also set to intercept server responses to our requests. The next panel down shows that we configured to intercept WebSocket client-to-server and server-to-client messages. And the next set of options includes one that we may find useful from time to time, which is to unhide hidden fields in a response so that we can see everything on the page. Below that, we can see the settings for matching and automatically replacing parts of request and response messages with some comments as to their use. For advanced work, we can define our own as well, but for the purposes of this course, we'll be using the defaults for interception. We'll be looking in detail at the repeater and intruder capabilities as we go through the course, so we'll leave our first look here However, before we leave, let's touch quickly on project options, because there's something we need to be aware of in how Burp Suite does some of its testing. Specifically, when we're using Burp Suite Professional, Burp Suite uses a collaboration server to support certain forms of analysis. The default, as we can see, is to use the public Portswigger collaboration server. This means that when we're doing scans, Burp Suite will use the collaboration server address in a target request, and after sending the test message to the target, 
can query the collaboration server to check whether the target interacted with it. An example of where we might do this is when checking for a blind SQL vulnerability. Portswigger has designed the collaboration server to be safe to use, but if using a public server is a concern for you, then this page is where you can disable it or configure your own private collaboration server. When we're testing websites, we'll often use a tool such as Burp Suite to intercept web traffic and allow us to inspect the web messages, change them, and insert new ones. This is known as proxying. When we normally connect, traffic would go from our browser directly to the website. When we use Burp Suite as a proxy, that traffic goes from the browser into Burp Suite and is then sent on to the web application. Burp Suite is set up to do this and includes its own browser so that we can work directly from Burp Suite. However, if you want to use an external browser such as Kali's Firefox, then all we need to do is to configure it to direct its web traffic to Burp Suite. Let's see how we do that. Let's open our Firefox browser in Kali. This, by default, will directly connect to the website. To change Firefox to go via our proxy, we select the Options menu at the top right and Preferences, and we scroll down to Network Settings. In Settings, we can see that we're currently set for No Proxy. To proxy through Burp Suite, we'll select Manual Proxy. We'll be running Burp Suite as a proxy in Kali, so the IP address for HTTP traffic is our local host, 127.0.0.1. I've already set the port to 8080, and we'll use the proxy settings for FTP and HTTPS traffic as well. We can click OK, and we're set up to use a proxy. Before we leave, let's take a quick look at how we might use Burp Suite to intercept web traffic from an Android phone. We can get to the proxy settings by long press on the network name and selecting Modify Network. Check Show Advanced Options and select Proxy Manual. And then we get the proxy setup screen. All we need to do now is to set the proxy address to the IP address of our server hosting Burp Suite, set the port to 8080, and we're ready to proxy our mobile traffic. We've got Burp Suite open, so let's check Burp's proxy settings. We'll select Proxy Intercept. We'll turn off Intercept, and we'll open the browser. And we now have Burp Suite's version of the Chrome browser running. And let's navigate to 10.2.20. And here we have the Metasploitable server. Back in Burp Suite at Target Sitemap, we can see that we've captured the web traffic to and from Metasploitable. We can expand the web tree in the left-hand pane to see the pages that we've found, and some that are referenced from that. And we can right-click on the top URL to get a context menu. Note there isn't an option to spider or crawl the website, as the Community Edition only records what we visit when we're navigating a site. We can see the list of message exchanges at the top right, and the request and response messages for the currently selected exchange are shown in the panel below. The top item in the list is the page we navigated to, and Burp Suite shows us the links that we can navigate to from that page. If we click on Mutilidi, we can see that it has the request ready to go, but no response. We can send this request from within Burp Suite, or we can go back to the browser and click on the Mutilidi link. Now when we go back to Burp Suite, we can see that the Mutilidi request and some additional page requests have been logged, as have a lot more pages that can be selected from the Mutilidi page. If we look at the response message, we can see that we found a comment which tells us the password to the database and suggests that no one will ever see it. An early win using Burp Suite. We've already seen that in the target scope settings we can include or exclude URLs from our scope. However, there's another way to do this. We can select, for example, Utilidi in the website tree and right click. And we have an option to add to scope. Let's do that. Burp Suite now pops up a message indicating that we can stop collecting out of scope items, and this will help us focus on the target information we're interested in. And we'll do that. Now if we check in Target 
Scope, we can see that this is now included in the Scope panel. Now in the browser, when we select DVWA and go back to Burp Suite, we can see that we didn't collect the DVWA page because it's out of scope. Back in Target Scope, we can manually add HTTP 2.20 slash DVWA to our sites of interest. We can visit that again in the browser. And back in Burp Suite, we can see that we're now collecting DVWA traffic as well. At the dashboard, we can see that at the top right, we have a link to find out more about the Burp Suite Professional Edition. Let's have a look at that. We sent to the Portswigger website, and if we scroll down, we can see a brief summary of what's in the Community Edition and the extra features in the Professional Edition. Let's leave the Community Edition. And let's take a quick look at the Professional Edition. We'll select Burp Suite from the top ribbon and we see the Professional Edition start up. We'll skip the update. Again, we'll take the temporary default project and the Burp Suite defaults. We can see the main dashboard screen pretty much as it is in the Community Edition. Let's switch off intercepts, open the browser, and again visit Metasploitable 10.0.2.20. In our target sitemap, we can again expand 10.0.2.20 in the left-hand panel, and we see the same messages and forward links that we saw in the Community Edition. However, if we right-click, we can now see that we have options to passively and actively scan this host. Passive scanning just spiders or crawls the website, finding all the pages, while active scan tests for vulnerabilities as it does so. Let's actively scan and we quickly see the pages being scanned and problems being registered in the right-hand Issues pane. We've already looked at Metasploitable, but it's useful to have a few systems to test against. The broken web application from OWASP offers a number of useful web apps that we can use for testing, and it's available as a virtual machine appliance that we can download. I've downloaded it and imported it into VirtualBox. I've started up the broken web app, so let's browse to it. 10.0.2.22 And here we have the broken web application server. It incorporates a number of training and testing platforms, such as WebGoat, RailsGoat, the original damn vulnerable web application, a useful web testing trainer called Security Shepherd, and Mutilidi Second an updated version of the website that we looked at in Metasploitable. There's also a number of older real-world applications, such as Orange HRM. The Broken Web application is a testing solution in its own right, but also provides a useful target that we can use to exercise our skills with Burp Suite. The extremely vulnerable web application is a PHP SQL website, which we can run on our Kali system. Let's start up our Apache and MySQL services. sudo service apache2 start. sudo service MySQL start. And then let's go to our web root and clone the XVWA application. cd slash var slash www slash html and we'll sudo git clone https github.com s for n 7 h 0 xvwa dot git okay 
Let's set up a user for XVWA and create the XVWA database. sudo mysql minus u root minus e create database XVWA. sudo mysql minus u root minus e grant all privileges on star.star .star to xman at localhost identified by xman. We now need to configure this account in xvwa. sudo nano xvwa slash config.php and we need to change root to xman and the password to xman. OK. Now let's go to XVWA and complete the setup. OK. We won't be using these targets in the course, but you might want to use them for your own practice with Burp Suite. Let's use Burp Suite Professional Edition and take a deeper look at crawling a website. We'll switch off Intercept, open the browser, and we'll visit 10.0.2.20, which is our Metasploitable 2 server. In our sitemap, we can expand 10.0.2.20 in the left-hand panel, and we can see our visited page and the forward links. Let's right-click and open the Scan panel. Here we can see the scan parameters. We set to crawl and audit the URL 10.0.2.20 using HTTP and HTTPS. We'll not make any changes, so let's select OK. And we can see the website tree is being populated. Back at the dashboard, we can see in the lower right pane that the crawl has started. We can scroll to see the crawl happening. Crawling a website takes a while, so we'll wait until this finishes. Once the crawl finishes, Burp Suite begins its audit, and we can see more problems appearing in the top right hand issues pane. Back in the site map, we can see red dots starting to appear beside pages with high severity issues. If we click on Mutilidae, we can see in the lower right pane that it's vulnerable to file path manipulation. We can also click on an issue in the top right hand pane and get the details shown together with the relevant web page. The audit will take quite a while, but let's see what we have so far. Let's take a look at the OS command injection and the web home entry. We can see not only the advisory in the lower pane, but also two request and response messages. Sometimes we'll be doing authenticated scans, or we'll have found credentials in some way. If we have credentials to use, we can add them. We do that, the scan page, by selecting Application Login. And we can add a new application login, perhaps DVWA, with the username of admin and password as password. This then allows Burp Suite to use the credentials when it sees a login form on the website and allows further crawling of the pages behind the login page. 
It's not unusual to find a web server which has a number of web applications, each with their own root, or has special administrative pages in the website which are accessible only by direct reference and not linked at all to the main web root. As an example, PHP web applications may have a standalone PHP info or my PHP admin page. Let's take a look at one of the servers at the main Hack the Box lab at address 10.10.10.191. This is a target called Blunder. We can use special tools such as Derby, GoBuster, and Derbuster to look for hidden web pages, but we also have this capability directly available in Burp Suite. Let's take a look at how Burp Suite finds pages which are not directly linked to the main web application. We'll switch off Intercept and then go to Target, Scope, and we'll add 10.10.10.191 to the target cut. This will focus our search results. OK, let's go back to Proxy and open a browser. And we'll visit 10.10.10.191. OK, let's go to the sitemap, target sitemap. We can expand the URL to see that we've got the main root page and another page called BL Kernel. There are also some other links visible on these pages which haven't yet been visited. Let's right click and select scan. We'll just do a crawl using HTTP only to find all the pages linked from the root. OK. We can see the crawl proceeding at the dashboard page. Let's come back when we finish the crawl. OK, we finished the scan and visited the pages we'd seen, but we've not added any further folders. Now let's right click and select Engagement Tools, Discover Content. We need to configure the discovery, so let's select Config. We'll set the depth to 2. Switch the internal lists off. And we'll select the custom directory list. of Durbuster's medium file. We'll also uncheck some of the extensions. And we'll go back to control and set the session running. We can go to the sitemap shown on the discovery panel. And we see some additional entries start to be added. We quickly find another folder called Icons. And we've also found one called Admin. And if we go to the browser and look at our admin page, we see a Bloodit login. And Bloodit is a flat file content management system. As with the other website discovery tools, the success we get by doing content discovery very much depends upon the quality of the word list we use, and in some cases, the way in which we manipulate web content to form special purpose additional word list entries. We'll be spending a lot of time looking at messages, so it's useful to really understand how Burp Suite presents messages to us and what's in them. Let's load some data by visiting Mutilidi on our Metasploitable server. We'll switch off Intercept, open the browser, and we'll navigate to 10.0.2.20 Mutilidi. There are three panels we're interested in regarding messages. The Contents panel shows the message exchange with the relevant server, the method and URL on the left, and the timestamp if we scroll to the right. In between we have the response status, 
the length of the response, including the header, the type of content, and for HTML, the web page title. Below that, we have the request and response panels, which we've already seen can be displayed as tabs, side by side, or vertically. The content is displayed in raw readable form as standard. But for the response message, we have the option of pretty form, which adjusts the message content alignment, and render form, which shows it as processed HTML. The standard context menu is available as a right click on messages in the content panel and through the action drop downs in the request and response panels. The search entry box at the bottom of the request and response panels allows searching of the relevant panel for strings. For example, we can put in web. And we see that web is highlighted in the message. The tools icon provides a couple of options we can use when searching. Case and regular expression being two of the three. We can also open out the inspector. And this provides a quick look at key areas of interest, such as request attributes, request headers, and response headers. We'll often be looking for information in the message body. For example, let's visit the zero bank, HTTP zero dot web app security dot com. And we can sign in using our credentials username as the username and password as the password. OK, let's go to pay bills. And let's make a payment to Sprint of $75. Let's see what this looks like in Burp Suite. If we select Zero Bank in the left hand list of websites and look down the content pane, we'll see we have a post transaction. When we select that, we can see the payment we made in the body of the message. Know that the input fields from the form are being sent as a string of items concatenated with ampersands and each item being a keyword, an equal sign, and a value. This is a common way of standard HTTP data being sent. We need to be aware that what we get on the browser may not always be what's in the message, and Burp Suite provides a couple of ways for us to detect that. Let's take a quick look at an anonymous feedback service, a small HTML file I've prepared for Carly. There's a copy of this in your exercise folder if you want to follow along. Let's open a Python website, Python minus M, simple HTTP server, and we'll run it on port 80. OK, let's take a look at that in Burp Suite's browser. 127.19.1. Slash, and the file I've got is called hide.html. Okay, we can send feedback anonymously. Let's put in feedback. I am blowing the whistle. And then we'll submit. And we get a nice thank you back for our anonymous feedback. Let's do that again. But before we do that, we'll turn on intercept. And then we'll submit. When we look at the get, we can see that this is a get message with parameters. In this case, the feedback we entered 
and also our user ID 3487, even though we didn't put that in. Again, these are shown as two items concatenated by an ampersand, each one being a keyword, equals, and a value. Let's do that once again, and this time, before we visit the site, we'll go to Proxy Options, and under Response Modification, we'll check Unhide Hidden Form Fields. OK. Now we'll refresh the Heidi page. I switch intercept off, so now when we go to 127.0.0.1 slash Heidi.html, we see there's another field on the form. It's a hidden field on the form which has been populated with a value, but not displayed. We can also go back to our sitemap and look at the original GET request for Heidi.html. And look at the response to the GET request. And sure enough, in the form we can see an input type equals hidden. And in this case, with a fixed value. But it could be filled in with an active fingerprinting code. We may be interested in request message headers so that we can manipulate request parameters on a post message and to access the session IDs. In some messages, credentials are sent as an authorization header, and in others, they may be part of the message body. There are also a number of specific attacks that can be performed on elements of the message header, such as web cache poisoning and virtual host brute forcing. It's not always obvious what's being sent as messages when using Burp Suite. Let's look at what happens when we're working with an example of a login page. We'll look at another hack the box target called Jerry on 10.10.10.95. When we scan this system, we find it's got a website running on port 8080. Let's go take a look. Okay, we'll set our target scope to 10.10.10.95 and we'll limit it to 8080. We'll go to proxy, intercept off, open a browser, and visit the website 10.10.10.95.8080. We're presented with the default Tomcat web page, and we have action buttons on the right for the website, the manager, and the host manager. Let's try the manager link. This requests a user ID and a password. Let's put in Tomcat Tomcat. OK, we get a failed login. Let's cancel the retry. And we see a 401 error for incorrect credentials. Let's have a look at our sitemap. When we look at the sitemap, we just see a couple of 200 responses as the two top messages. There's no message sending our credentials with a failed response. However, if we look at the line above the messages panel, it indicates that four XX responses are hidden. Let's click on that line and we get a drop down box in which we can configure what we want to see. Let's click show all to make sure we're not missing anything. And apply it. Now if we click back in the Messages panel, we now get all the messages showing, including a 401 response. Let's have a look at it. We can see that it's a request to Manager HTML. And the response is unauthorized. The message is flagged as a potential alert with a clear text submission of password, but it's not shown in the request. Let's go back to the web page. And select Manager again. 
We'll put in Tomcat. Tomcat. But before we send this, we'll switch on interception. Proxy, intercept on. And we'll sign in. Now when we send the login message, the manager HTML message pops up, complete with an authorization at line 4. Let's copy the authorization string. Copy. Select Decoder. Paste it into the box. And decode as Base64. There we have our credential showing as separated with a colon. Let's go back to the browser and select the Manager app. And we'll turn Intercept off. And this time we'll put Bobcat Bobcat and sign in. And that failed. OK, let's try again with Kitty Kitty. But we fail there as well. Let's have a look at the sitemap again. And we can see our 401 message. Let's see what happens when we do this using Kali's Firefox. We'll visit the site 10, 10, 95, 80, 80. We'll select Manager App. And we'll enter the credentials Bobcat, Bobcat. OK. And we get a rejection and we can cancel the request. And we get the 401 unauthorized response. Let's take a look at Burp Suite's sitemap. In this case, we see the request with its 401 response. And we can see the authorization at the bottom of the packet. And let's copy that. And decode it. And we can see Bobcat, Bobcat. OK. Let's do that again, and this time we'll try Kitty and Kitty. And we fail again. And when we go back to our sitemap and have a look, we can see we've still only got a 401, but this time we have a different authorization code. And when we have a look at that, it's Kitty Kitty. Burp Suite has replaced our previous calls to Manager HTML, and all it shows us in the content panel is the last one. However, we can go to proxy HTTP history and see the complete set of messages. We can see our early messages that we sent from Burp Suite, followed by four at the bottom, which came from Firefox. If we check the bottom four, the top one shows a message without the authorization code, followed by one with the authorization code. And let's copy that. Go to decoder. And we can see that's Bobcat Bobcat. And the bottom two, the first has no authorization code and the second has the authorization code. And you can check the final authorization code and that's Kitty. We've demonstrated a number of points, but the fundamental learning is to know where to go if you're not seeing what you need to see in the main Burp Suite panel.
Changing the content of messages is very easy with Burp Suite. We'll use the Xero Banking site as an example of how we do this. Let's navigate to the Xero Online Banking site. That's http zero.webappsecurity.com and we'll log in with the credentials, literally, of username and password. Username and password. I'll select transfer funds. I can see that I have $1,000 in my savings account. I'll transfer $10 from savings to brokerage. And a comment of a small donation. And continue. And we get a verification screen. I'll now go back to Burp Suite. I'll now set intercept on and submit. The request message pops up in Burp Suite with the transfer amount of $10. I'll change that to 99 and switch intercept off. Back in the bank, I can see verification that the transaction amount of $99 has been transferred. If we're using a public Wi-Fi hotspot to do our banking, we're leaving ourselves open to a man-in-the-middle attack and to the attacker changing not only the amount we're remitting, but also the account it's going to. Let's see how we can use Burp Suite on message headers to gain information. We'll be using the Shocker system on Hack the Box for this test. OK, let's visit the Shocker system on 10.10.10.56. And it's a bug. When we look at the sitemap, we don't have a great deal here. So let's do a scan. And we'll crawl to see what else we can see. And if we look at the dashboard, the crawl started and it's completed. And there's nothing else there. OK, let's now do a discovery with our engagement tools, discover content. We'll set the configuration to depth of two. We'll select the medium text directory list. And we won't bother testing for any extensions. So we just look for folders. And we'll start that. And wait and see what we get. OK, so we very quickly get a CGI bin folder. We might want to go into that in a little bit more detail. So let's stop this discovery and do another one focused just on CGI bin. So we'll stop this. Engagement tools, discover content. This time we'll limit it to the CGI bin folder. Again, recurs to a depth of two. We'll just use the built-in shortlist for this test. And we'll look for folders, but we'll also look for the CGI and the SH file extensions for files. OK, and we'll set that running and again wait and see what we get. OK, we've now got a hit on a file user.sh. So let's close the content discovery. And go back to our browser and look for CGI bin user.sh. OK, this comes back as an uptime test script result. Let's see what Burp Suite made of it in the site map. And it's a pretty straightforward call and response. There's a well-known attack on sites hosting bash scripts called Shellshot, and we can invoke it using a custom header. Let's see if this site's vulnerable. We'll 
right click on the get exchange and send it to repeater opening repeater we can send the message and we get the response as we got before we'll now replace the user agent with the special shellshock string open close bracket curly open colon semicolon curly close and then echo bin bash minus c who am i and we'll send that and this time we get back the username shelly we've been able to use the shellshock attack to get command execution the strange sequence of characters before echo is the shellshock magic string let's change that to instead of who am i to cat slash etc slash password and send that again and we now have the full password file dumped out we can also dump out shelley's home folder with ls slash home slash Shelley and so we can now use the cat command to dump out the user text file and get the user flag we'll often see websites which are supported by SQL databases either built into the platform or on a back-end server SQL map is a key tool to use on these sites to identify the SQL server and to determine whether it's exploitable Burp Suite and SQL Map are often used together. Let's see how we can use them as a toolset to gain access to an SQL database using the Europa server which we have on our LinkedIn Learning Lab. Let's make sure the Europa Corp admin portal, which we found using our previous reconnaissance, is in our host file. sudo nano slash etc slash hosts and we'll add 10.10.10.22 admin portal dot europa corp dot htb and we'll save that okay now in burp suite let's set the target scope and we'll add in https admin dash portal dot europa corp dot htb okay and proxy intercept off open a browser and visit https admin portal dot europacorp.htb The portal is looking for an email address and a password. Let's send in a request with a test email address and then check the message exchanges in Burp Suite. So we'll test at test.nz and for the password we'll put in password and login okay in our target sitemap we can see we've recorded our login post and when we check it out we can see that our credentials are at the bottom of the message so let's copy them And we can use SQL map to check the parameter string containing the credentials we're posting on the login PHP form. And we can use the minus minus data option to provide the data portion of the post, and the minus DBMS option to force SQL map to focus on the MySQL database.
So we'll use SQL map minus U. And we're going to be going to HTTPS admin portal dot Europa Corp dot HTB slash login dot PHP minus minus data equals and we'll drop in the string from the message and minus minus dbms equals mysql okay and we'll take the defaults okay sql maps finished and we can see that we've now identified three ways to inject sql let's list out the databases so we'll reissue the command and we'll ask it to list the databases. And we can see we have the information schema and the admin databases. And we can now see what tables are in the admin database. So we'll select the database as admin and request the tables. And we have a users table. So again, let's set the table to users and just dump out the contents. And here we have our users and password hashes. Let's take this one step further. We know from SQL map that there are five columns in the login query table. Let's select the login post request, right click on it and send it to the repeater. We'll go to the repeater and use the knowledge we got from SQL map to inject a union command into our request. Let's insert after the email address quote plus or plus one equals one plus limit plus one plus dash dash plus percent 20 and let's send that and when we send this we get a redirect and if we follow the redirection we can see that we're logged into the website admin. We can take the actions and request in the browser in the original session. And if we copy the URL and paste it in, we've got the admin portal. We've successfully used Burp Suite to inject an SQL union command to circumvent the authentication and deliver admin website access. We've looked at how we might obtain data that SQL map can use, but another way of working with SQL map is to feed it a complete message. Let's see how we do this using another of the main Hack the Box servers, Falafel. Let's go to Falafel on 10.10.10.73. And we presented with the Falafel Lovers website with the login page. Let's go and try and log in. OK, let's try some basics like admin, admin. And we get a message wrong identification, admin. If we try that again with random random we get a message try again the first message is given for a valid user id but incorrect password and the second when the user id is incorrect okay let's go to our target sitemap and look at the post message 
and in the actions select copy to file and we'll copy that to falafel.txt Now we can run our SQL command using the request packet and the value wrong identification, which indicates a valid response on username. SQL map minus R for the request packets falafel.txt and minus minus string wrong. identification. OK, we've found an injection. We can now run this, adding minus minus DBS to list the databases. And we have Falafel and Information Schema. And again, we can look at our Falafel database and look at the tables. and we find a users table. So let's dump that table. Minus T users, minus, minus dump. Okay, and we found the user IDs, admin and Chris, together with their hashes. We won't go any further, but you could try cracking them if you're interested. Previously, we looked at how to gain access to the admin console in Europa. Let's pick up from there. Let's select the Tools link. This brings up a script, which is a template for creating a VPN connection. We can see there's a box to enter an IP address, and we can see in the script the places where this will be inserted. Let's put in an IP address, anything for this test and then press the Generate button below the script panel. 10.10.10.99 and Generate. We can now see the generated script. In itself, it's not much use to us, but let's look at the post message to tools.php. We can see the pattern shows IP address, which we expect to be replaced, and the IP address field as the IP address we typed in. This is in fact going to be processed in a PHP regular expression replacement function, pregreg replace. There's a known feature, vulnerability or backdoor in pregreg replace, which allows execution of PHP code. This is triggered by using the E command after the pattern. So we can replace the data we see with the string pattern equals thing one e and IP address is system and then a command plus text is thing two. In practice, we'll need to replace the two forward slashes in pattern with the 2f hex representation. Let's go back and run the generate again. And this time we'll set intercept on and catch the message so we can replace the data. proxy intercept on and we'll go back and generate. OK, back in Burp Suite, we have the message intercepted. Let's replace the data with our replacement string. Pattern equals something. Percent to F and E. And IP address equals system ls minus al. Slash and text equals something. OK, this string is 68 characters long, so we'll replace the content length with the value 68 and turn intercept off.
OK, it's a bit messy, but we've got our root directory listing. And let's do that again. And this time, we'll change the string to something e and IP address equals system ls minus al slash home. And text equals something. And the length this time is 72. And we can turn that off. And we find there's our home directory listing, and there's just John. We know that there's a user.txt in the home directory, so let's use cat to type it out. We'll leave burp suite to sort out the message length. So we've been able to inject commands into the message, and we've got the user token. Let's have a look at the intruder capability in Burp Suite. For this, we'll use the DAB server, which can be accessed at the main Hack the Box lab, and we'll test the website on port 80. OK, let's turn intercept off, and open the browser, and browse to 10.10.10.86. OK, we get a login screen. Let's try admin admin and see if we're lucky. Apparently not. OK, let's see if we can brute force this with Intruder. We'll go to the sitemap. We'll select the post message. And under actions, we'll send to Intruder. OK. We'll now select Intruder Positions. We can see the user ID and password in the bottom of the message. And we can see all the input fields have section markers around them. We'll click Clear to get rid of the section markers. And highlight our password entry. And press Add Section Marker. We'll next select Payloads. We now have to get a list of values to try as passwords. We have the payloads in the top section of the screen, followed by options for processing. And at the bottom, we can do encoding of the payload. Useful, for example, if we need it to be Base64 encoded. In this case, we'll keep things fairly simple. For our payload, we'll select Load. And then we'll select the file from user share word list metasploit unix passwords.txt. And we load them. We won't do any payload processing, but let's just have a look at that. We'll select add. And if we have a look at the payload processing options, we can see various options that we have for processing, including prefixes, suffixes, and so on. However, for the moment, let's cancel that. If we check the Options tab, we can see we have quite a lot of control over how we attack the site and how we process the results. However, for now, we'll leave this as default and just click on Start the attack at the top. As we check, the responses are all coming back at 709 bytes, so we haven't yet found the password. OK, we've finished. And as we scan through, we see that, in fact, they're all 709 bytes and we haven't found the password. Let's do that again, and this time we'll add some payload processing. Let's add, and we'll select the rule type modify case, 
and we'll select the sub option to proper name. This will capitalize the first character. OK, let's run that again. Now, as we look down, we can see that entry 28, which is password 1, is 512 bytes. We can select that entry and we can check the response packet and we find that we've logged in and that we haven't been redirected. This is one of the options that we can set in the Options tab. If we go to Options, we currently never follow redirections. We can set that to follow redirections. But for now, let's go back to the browser and enter our credentials of admin and our newly found password one. And we get access to the site. Let's look at how we modify cookies with Intruder. We'll use the DAB server again. We need to enable cookies for this test, and these are set off by default in Burp Suite's browser. So we'll go to proxy, switch intercept off, and we'll open the browser. We'll select the browser options, settings, privacy and security, cookies and other site data, and we'll allow all cookies. OK, we've already seen the main website, so let's log in to start our session. 10.10.10.86. And we can log in with admin password1. From a testing point of view, we didn't find anything useful in this main site. However, there is another website on port 8080, so let's check that out. We'll go to 8080 and we get a message saying access denied, password authentication cookie not set. Let's have a look at the message in Burp Suite. So we go to target and then look at the message on 8080 and we can see the request has a cookie in the header specifying the session ID but no password. We'll have to do a bit of guessing. We'll guess we need a cookie entry saying password equals. Let's go back to proxy intercept and switch on intercept. And then in the browser, once more navigate to port 8080. OK, we don't need to modify the cookie itself as the contents are included in the message. Instead, we can add another entry as though it had come from the cookie. So we'll put in password equals password one, and turn intercept off to send the message. Back in the browser, we now have a new message, access denied, password authentication cookie incorrect. It appears our guess that we need an input field called password was in fact correct, but the password isn't. Let's go back to the sitemap and select action, send to intruder. We'll select positions and we'll clear the section marks around the password values. We'll add that. We'll go to payloads once again. And this time we'll use a runtime file. And we'll select the file as Unix passwords.txt. So this is doing exactly the same thing as loading it. Let's start the attack. OK. As we look down the list, we can see we have the failed attempt to response size of 491 bytes. But at entry 41, we have a response size of 707 for the password secret. When we select it, 
and select the response message and then render it we can see the message was able to successfully access the site and we have a TCP ticket test page. We won't go any further with this but to recap we've been able to alter the value of a cookie being sent in a message and manipulate it to find the password to access the site. Let's revisit the Intruder Positions tab on the latest DAB test we've done. At the top we have a drop down box which says Sniper and that's what we used. If we click on this, we can see there are three additional attack types battering ram, pitchfork and cluster bomb. The default sniper attack which we've used supports a single payload. Sniper is ideally suited to a single field attack. If we put the payload on multiple fields it will try each field in turn against the list with the other fields retaining the fixed value in the source message. The number of messages sent will therefore be the number of fields to test times the number of entries in the list. The battering ram attack extends the sniper and again supports just one payload. When multiple fields are specified, each payload entry is applied concurrently to each field. In other words, all field values are set the same. This might be useful, say, for trying the same value in both a user ID and a password field. The number of messages sent will be just the number of entries in the list. The pitchfork attack uses multiple sets of payloads, one for each field to be tested. The attack will try the corresponding values in each of the payloads at the same time. So in the fifth message, the fifth entry from each payload set will be used against their respective fields. The number of messages will be equal to the number of entries in the smallest of the lists. The cluster bomb attack uses multiple sets of payloads, one for each field to be tested, and tries every combination across all the fields. The number of messages is the product of the number of entries in each set. This can get very large very quickly. The intruder has additional ways of attacking sites. Let's go to the payloads tab. And we have a look at the payload type drop down. We've used the simple list and the runtime file. And note at the right of the payload set drop down, we have a count of how many entries we'll be trying. Now let's take a look at the brute forcer. We can see that a panel appears which allows us to select the character set and the minimum and maximum length to try. Burp Suite will generate all the values for the brute force attack. And we can see that this is over a million and a half. Let's rerun our attack on the cookie. We'll set the maximum length to 6. Burp Suite gives up on estimating the number. Anyway, let's start the attack. We can see the password options being generated. It's going to take a long time to try even the passwords between 4 and 6 characters long. A very long time indeed. The intruder module is very sophisticated and there's a lot of options to try when using it. The best way for you to understand the extent of the intruder's capabilities is to try them out yourself on the additional test targets we've set up. Let's see how we install extensions into Burp Suite. We'll go to the Extender tab and select the App Store. There are a lot of extensions and it's worth looking through them as you develop your Burp Suite skills to see which might be useful. One commonly used extension is CO2. This enables us to integrate SQL Map into the Burp Suite menus. Let's install CO2. And we now have a CO2 tab on the top menu. We need to go to CO2 and select config and enter slash user slash share SQL map SQL map pi as the SQL map path. And note that for Linux we need to have Xterm installed. OK, we'll click OK. We can install Xterm simply with sudo apt install Xterm. OK, we're now ready to go. Let's revisit Falafel 
at 10.10.10.73 and try to log in with admin admin and if we go to the target sitemap and on the post message right click extensions co2 sent to sql mapper the sql mapper tag is set up automatically for us so all we need to do is run it and we find the injection point in the site we can now continue in xterm as we did previously with the injection from within burp suite or if we want we can take the generated sql map string and run it in our normal terminal by saying SQL map and pasting the string. And again we find the injection. 